Jai Sadgurudev and good morning to all of you. My name is Srirang and I have joined this satsang from uh, North Carolina. So before we begin this session, I would like to bow down and offer my prayers to the holy feet of Lord Sadgurudev. Uh, please join me by closing your eyes. Bar bar vandana karu sad guru dev हे गुरु बंदी छोर मुँह उबारो हे गुरु यह सौ बार निहो तो थैंक यू एवरीवन फॉर जॉइनिंग दिस सत्संग विद इन करंट टाइम्स यू नो डे टू डे लाइफ हैज बिकम बिजी इन फुलफिलिंग आवर फिजिकल एंड मेंटल and social responsibilities. In this fast-paced routine life, the requirements of our soul are often forgotten. So, first of all, I would like to congratulate each one of you for taking some time from your busy schedule to fulfill the requirements of our soul through this satsang. So, today we will continue our discussion on Swarved Dohas. Uh, Swarved was written by Sadhguru Sadafal Devji Maharaj in his uh, Conscious Samadhi. Uh, what he has documented in uh, Swarved is his own experiences uh, when he was, you know, um, uh, when, he, when he sat on the in the Chetan Samadhi. So uh, it is basically a duty of every disciple to read and understand Swarved and uh, to basically assist us in this process. We have with us very knowledgeable disciple of Sadgurudev Vijayji with us. Uh, he is also president of uh, North America Institute of Vihangam Yoga, and we have been blessed to uh, hear from him his knowledge uh, and you know his understanding of um, Sadguru Dev's uh, knowledge, uh, you know throughout various satsangs. So over to you, uh, Vijay Ji. Bar bar vandan karu. सद गुरु देव हमार यहाँ वहाँ सब ठाम में महिमा अपरम पार शरण शरण में शरण हूँ हे गुरु बंदी छोर मोही उबारो हे गुरु यह सौ बार निहोर जन अधीन वंदन करूं कहीं विधि की जैसे वार पार की गम नहीं नमो नमो गुरुदेव We have very wonderful doha to discuss today from Swarved the Swarved, which is Encyclopedia of Spirituality. It is the reference, the spiritual reference book for anybody who is truly looking forward for enlightenment, the ultimate experience in the field of spirituality. Many people consider spirituality you know, confined just within the humanity. You know, there is a definitely relation between humanity and spirituality, but just the humanity, the human values, becoming a nice human being, 
if that is the boundary of spirituality in anybody's understanding, then this is a very narrow sight of what spirituality truly is. Because spirituality begins after that. The humanity is essential. First, we need to carry the human values. We need to become human first. And then we become eligible for the real spiritual journey. First, we need to become righteous. We need to have control over our mind, over our senses. And instead of behaving reckless, uncontrolled, we start living a righteous life. And then we become eligible for experiencing the unseen, the one that our physical eyes cannot see, that our ear cannot hear about, our intellect cannot comprehend with its physical abil ability, that unseen inexpressible the supreme being comes in the yogic experience only when it grows deep in the journey of meditation so this doha which is taken from swarve the first canto third chapter sixth doha is about progressing towards that deep meditation journey, preparing yourself for that journey. So I request one of the volunteers to please uh, come forward and, and recite it with the devotion in the heart. In, anybody, please. Yeah. Okay, I, I will do yeah. it. <clears throat> Just the Doha, yeah. yeah sure. Ahar neend ke alp me drud ho ya abhyas nishchay niyam vilas me vardhat vimal vikas In the Doha, from Svarved is you know embedded with Sadguru's energy and Sadguru Bhav. Sadguru has embedded his energy, his uh, powers in Svarved Doha. If one truly recites Svarved Doha by having devotion for the Sadguru in the heart. Then just the recital of Sarvet Doha itself starts changing your vrittis. Vrittis. Change of the vritti is the main thing, the main component that define how transformed we have become. How transformed is our actions, our tendencies, our liking and disliking. If one thing that can define that, that is nothing but vrittis. So let me, let me first go through what the translation, the commentary of this Doha is, and then I will share my screen to explain the fundamentals of how and why one will, you know, constrain or restrain themselves to attain the, the height of meditation experience. Swamiji has said, Ahar neend ke alp me dhid hoye abhyas. So one will get the firmness in the practice of meditation only when there is a discipline in the food, the ahar means food, and sleep, 
neend means sleep so when the ahar the food and the sleep is disciplined is moderate is to the quantity that is adequate and required not more than that it should be moderate it should be controlled it should be within the limit only when that happens then one further find the easiness in strengthening their meditation journey nischay niyam vilas me vardhat vimal vikash only by being firm and disciplined one finds growth in the meditation journey so in the commentary sadguru dharmchand dev ji maharaj has written in hindi which is translated here in english that only an individual established in self restraint or sanyam is able to practice meditation in a resolute manner as experiences occur during meditative practice their worldly efforts or behaviors naturally start to decrease with moderation of diet and sleep firmness is achieved in one's meditative practice and the process of attaining an experiential light becomes accessible a practitioner of yoga the yogi reaches a state wherein they achieve ample sleep in a very short period of time having reached a distinct zone of yoga they attain the bliss of supreme being in the incessant 24 hour state of akhand samadhi therefore to progress on the path of yoga brahma vidya it is a necessity for dedicated practitioners of yoga to give exclusive attention to self restraint or sanyam and discipline or niyam and thereby apply efforts towards the upliftment of their soul so the main highlight in this doha is that for those who are truly desiring to progress in the spiritual experiences which is beyond eyes beyond ear those who want to experience the creator those who want to experience the self which is not physical rather a conscious entity those who are desiring to experience or enter into the portal of consciousness which otherwise is hidden from our physical senses for those deep seeker the sanyam the self restraint is doable is pleasing also because it gives immense satisfaction to those seekers dedicated seekers who truly wants to progress towards the experience of consciousness but those who are meditating only because they want to set themselves free from certain elements in the body let's say somebody is in anxiety and doctor ask them to meditate you know those who who still are confining their entire life within the worldly activities and they aim for worldly gains for them sanyam the self restraint becomes little difficult unless it is medically forced let's say somebody has the obesity or the high blood pressure or blood sugar 
then of course they are forced to take the restraint. So painfully, they painfully begin restraining themselves. But, you know, the adaptability of our mind and tongue is such that whatever you will mold this into for a repeated number of times, for, for multiple times, you will become that kind of personality. So one who starts restraining no matter for whatever reason, whether it is for the medically enforced reason or it is spiritually uh, motivated reason. There is a spiritual motivation or there is a medical enforcement. For whatever reason, if one starts restraining themselves into certain habit, into certain change of routine, and if they do it repeatedly on daily basis, that will change their personality. What you are today is defined by what are the active vrittis which are always rising within your heart from your chitta. The vrittis define your personality. Vrittis define your tendencies. Vrittis are those that define what you are likely to do, think, and act. What could be your thought? What could be your actions? They are all defined by, by what are the vrittis that are prominently active in your chitta. So let me share my screen and just to go a little uh, yeah go a little descriptive about it so vrittis as the word says vritti you know vritti uh, derives from vrit which in english is circle right so vritti is the etymology of vritti the root word is vrit and vrit means circle and what is circle? Circle is something that you, you know, always, you know, circle through the same thing. So same thing, you just keep moving, moving, moving. And that's what the vritti is. Vritti is something that creates a tendencies within the soul for engaging into the same thing again. So it, 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 causes tendencies within you to perform certain things that you have already done for which you you have already acquired the vritti within your heart so vrittis are in your chitta which is a repository for all your actions tendencies you know and uh, the desires, the um, desires in the, in the sense, the tendencies that define desires as well in this regard. So repository for all your actions, tendencies, your raga, your dvesh, you know, all different attributes that drive you into any actions are actually within your chitta. The chitta is what contains the repository of all your karmas. You know, actions means karma here. Your current karma also is being deposited in chitta. Your chitta is containing all your prior karmas and is also constantly recording your current karma. And whatever the set of karma you engage into, that define what vrittis will be on high rise. So which, so vrittis are
driving you into actions. Which vritti will be on rise is defined by the kind of actions you are majorly involved in. So by engaging yourself into a certain set of actions, you can change your vrittis. Let's say you are too bothered by a certain bad habit. So what is a way to cut off yourself from that tendency of repeating the same thing? If you keep engaging yourself again and again into the same action, then you're only strengthening the vritti for that. That means you are tying yourself further deep into that action. So by repeating the same action, you will never get quenched by that. It is not that if I desire so much of a subject, if I consume it, if I experience it again and again, and then a time will come that I'll be done with it and I'll not need it anymore. If you think that way, then think twice because... It is something like this. If there are two person, one who has never spoken, uh, smoken, let's say who has never smoken, no, so, no smoking, and the other person who has done that mistake once. The next opportunity, when there is a offer for smoke, the person who has smoken once is more likely to fall prey to it. Whereas the one who has restrained itself and has never smoked in life is more likely to control because he has never got a test of it yet. So once you create the vritti of certain experience, of certain action, that vritti is now there in your chitta and it will rise. The moment the subject will come, the vritti will rise for it. Because mind brings the subject to the chitta and the related vrittis are queried from the chitta and it rises. So kind of subjects that you interact with, the related vrittis start rising within your chitta. And this is why if one wants to succeed in meditation journey, it is important that we should have a little constraint, a restraint in our actions, in our thoughts, so that we don't allow the disturbing vrittis, the opposing vrittis to come into effect while we are meditating. Only when we have control on our actions, on our thought, on our sleep, on our diet, with proper sleep you'll infuse good energy, good thoughts, the peace within yourself. So proper sleep is also essential, but excessive sleep is going to allow the laziness to come over, the tamogun to rise. And when the tamogun will rise within you, then all the vrittis which were tamogun influenced, they will start rising. That's why excessive sleep is also not good. Nor is good when you have excessive food. And that's why Swamiji said that only when you constrain and take moderate food and sleep, you create the right vrittis within yourself. And with the control in food and diet and with the rise of sattvikta, the sattvik attribute within yourself, you will prepare the right ambience for the growth in meditation. And with the restraint in one thing, you know, just like 
the bad attributes the bad virtues are never alone you know bad virtues are never alone it comes in groups one invites another if you if you have let's say the deep attachment with something the raga for something and the moment anybody disturbs you you know experiencing the subject the anger will come so raga brings anger anger brings the bad actions uncontrolled behavior and that causes the sins in your life the fall in your character so one invites another ill virtue in your life similarly when you start acquiring satvikta within yourself even by controlling your food and your sleep that satvikta will reflect in various dimension of your character and will start inviting the other good virtues in your life just like when you have patience just the patience will also strengthen you to have control on your anger so one attribute one good attributes may one good attribute may invite or awaken other sets of good attribute so every small step like this where for the success in meditation if you really want to start awakening good virtues within yourself then begin with good sleep and control on your diet when you have good sleep and control good means means moderate sleep not less neither less nor more so when we begin with the proper sleep and proper diet and we initially force ourselves into regularity for the meditation initially we have to force and as we discussed that our mind is such that you can mold your mind into something and for molding your mind into something all you need is to go into repeat repeated action of certain things when you repeat certain things your mind molds into it and then the friction against that goes away otherwise mind has friction for things that demands going against your current attribute whatever you are today if if a corrupt person if somebody is having the lustful desire the desire that is not so good and at that moment even if you ask him to hey come and join satsang it will not like because it is filled with some unrighteous desires at that point it will demand that subject only what it is desiring for so the happiness in meditation happiness in constraining yourself in restraining yourself not only for the food but the sleep will only come when you are spiritually motivated when you are spiritually motivated then it is easier for you to control your food and sleep because then in attaining that self restraint in attaining that control over your senses itself will be very pleasing for you you will feel an achievement within yourself good so finally i am able to eat right i am able to sleep right you don't love your sleep rather you love your goal your goal is spiritually motivated and any steps towards that is going to be very pleasing for you and so it is very important that we be spiritually motivated not just 
physically the worldly motivated if you are worldly motivated if you have any worldly goal for example hey today i am restless i have anxiety doctor has asked me to meditate you will meditate for few days you will start feeling better because meditation anyway will work but your goal is so short sighted that the moment you start feeling better you will lose control over yourself you'll start getting back to your old habits but when you are spiritually motivated the spiritual journey is so deep and long and so satisfying if you really mold yourself into the spirituality and the elements of spirituality then it become eternally progressive for you if you are motivated for spiritual progress then there is no bigger goal than the pinnacle of spirituality that the dimension the the wideness in the spiritual field is so immense so much that it takes not just one life but multiple life to complete you know the spiritually motivated people not only enjoys the worldly life by having the awakened virtues within themselves even while they are in the journey while you are in the journey of spirituality you awaken certain virtues within your character that it becomes a joyful living in your life without being dependent on the worldly subjects but yet the goal is far away the spiritual goal is not that easy but in order to attain the ultimate spiritual goal you start molding your character your mind your behavior your thoughts in such a way that it creates the platform for happiness it creates the platform for peace while you are treading the path of spirituality you have not yet attained the ultimate goal of spirituality while you are treading into that path it creates the ambience of the peace within yourself and how so because of having the sanyam the restrained as a inherent quality within your character you will start being satisfied with whatever you have all because you don't look forward to unnecessary things anything in the worldly you will count on or you will depend on or you will go for only those which is necessary for your spiritual journey your now main goal has become spiritual in nature so any down or ups in the worldly life do not disturb you that much it will disturb you of course but when you are spiritually motivated then that disturbance will not last long but if you are only worldly motivated then that was your everything and if that itself fell if it shattered you will be shattered but but when you are spiritually motivated any fall in your physical life is not going to shatter you rather you will have the courage to tackle it again from the scratch rise from there you will you will be able to put the required purusharth the effort only because you have control on yourself when you have control on your senses when you have control on your mind then nothing is impossible for you if a human being can do a thing you can do that thing if we have control on our mind and senses you are extremely powerful to start anything from scratch only because one fail in life is because one is not having control on the senses and mind to guide the energy fruitfully in the required direction so spiritually motivated people become successful in all arena of life without 
without being attached to that it becomes the success becomes a second nature of a spiritually motivated person whatever the person will do it will do with 100% of control over the mind and senses so whatever it does it does 100% if it has to do any job in a worldly life, it will put 100% of consciousness into it because it is, it is capable to do that by being spiritually motivated. And so Sanyam that was brought up in this Doha today, the Sanyam means the self-control, the self-restraint, the restraining your the restraining of your mind and senses. That is a big power, a big tool for one to succeed not only in the spiritual life but also in worldly life. Sadguru Sadafal Devji Maharaj has similarly described various aspects, the various dimensions for the growth in the spiritual field in this epic called Swarved. I highly recommend those who have not yet seen Swarved, have not yet read Swarved, it is high time they go to us.vihangamyoga.org and order Swarved for them. With this I conclude my thoughts here. Jai Sadhguru, over to you. Shri Thank you Vijayji for explaining this Doha in very detail. Uh, this was really helpful. So I would request all the participants to take uh, advantage of this time and uh, you know ask any questions uh, related to this Doha. Yes, Sadhguru Dev. Good morning to all. Um, very, uh, very nicely um, discussed, Vijayji. Um, if you could elaborate just a little bit more on the Sanyam for the sleep aspect. Um, is there a recommended hour? Because uh, we do see that as the uh, sadha progresses in um, a spiritual path, then the bodily required sleep hours also reduce dramatically. But, uh, but if somebody is not that far and somebody is in the journey, then there's a certain um, amount of hours that the body will require so when it wakes up, it is refreshed. Otherwise, if it wakes up uh, before that hour, then there will be some sort of a jet lag feeling. So if you could just uh, 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 elaborate on that. Thank you. Very, very nice question, actually. And rightly said that everybody has uh, their own need of sleep. But good thing about this is that Swamiji, as in this Doha, has also mentioned about food and sleep together. And there is a reason behind that. And also mentioned that as we practice meditation, automatically our ability to rest our body improves. But it is a gradual progress. So, of course, we cannot cause a jet lag within our body by, you know, waking your body forcefully before time. The good thing about uh, the cycle of day and night, the sun setting and sunrise, is that it also relates to a cycle in our body. If there is a proper time for going to bed, then we must adhere to that. If we don't adhere to the proper time for going to bed, that disturbs our natural cycle of sleep. And that is where you know, sometimes even though you spend a lot many hours on the bed, we do not get fresh because we have disturbed the cycle within our body. So the first and foremost part of the Sanyam is 
to adhere to the right schedule for the sleep. That is the first thing. That's why Swamiji is also mentioned in this, in the second line, that Nische Niyama Vilasame. When you firmly get disciplined, you know, when only you have discipline also in sleep and then moderately control, you will have progress. So the first discipline that we need to bring in is to go to bed by around 10 o'clock. Pratmachar Deji, Sadhguru Dharamchand Deji Maharaj has mentioned this, that the best time for going to bed is before 10 o'clock. You know, if you go to bed by 9 o'clock, that is also good, 9, 10. For us who have to sp spend long hours at work, then 10 o'clock is ideal for us. If we go to bed by 10, by 10.30, if we are deep in sleep, then automatically, because we have gone to the bed in the right time of the cycle, we will have better chances of a deeper sleep. And when we have deep sleep, then the body will wake up automatically in the span of six hours, moderately, you know, six, sometimes six and a half, sometimes five and a half. But if you have a better sleep, when you go to bed in right time, on an average, your body will wake up in about six hours when you are not in the regular practice of meditation. But when you become regular in meditation practice and and the the day your meditation starts progressing into the inner sound, which is called anhad, you know, there are 10 mystical sounds happening in our head. The day you start going deeper into that level, then your sleep will be further reduced. But as Niranjanji rightly said that forcing ourselves uh, for, you know, getting up from sleep is not a good idea. Rather, what a good idea is to have control on our discipline of going to bed. If you go to bed in right time, you will have good sleep. And when your sleep is over, we should not overstay on, in the bed. You know, the Sanyam comes there that when you're awake, you should be awake. When it's time to go to bed, you should go to bed. We should not be tempted to continue doing something even though it is time to go to bed. So the maintenance of the or adherence of the schedule also comes under Sanyam. One loose Sanyam when they when they are undisciplined. When they are undisciplined, meaning they are not in Sanyam. Sanyam means discipline. You can say like that. Discipline and Sanyam are correlated. So by having discipline in what time you go to bed, how much you eat, you know, the food discipline, the food Sanyam is about how much you should eat. You should read your body that, oh, when I ate this less, I, I felt weaker. When I ate this much, I felt heavy. So we have to moderate it. We have to come to a point where we feel light in our belly. After having meal, we should feel energized, not lazy. So that everybody has their own equations and we have to read our body. But if we discipline ourselves for uh, you know, having right schedule for sleep and right quantity of food, automatically how much we have to sleep, we need to sleep, that will get controlled with our regular meditation practice. Gradually, it will start decreasing. Let it happen naturally. We should, we just should not overstay. When we are awake, we are awake. If we have that discipline, that means we are following Sanyam. Yeah. Yes. Um, it is sometimes difficult um, to um, 
and but definitely that discipline will and also waking up early around 5 5 a.m or even earlier uh, it will allow people to do the brahma uh, also so uh, that definitely yeah. makes sense yes yeah yeah that's and, like 10 o'clock 10 o'clock yeah. is a good time 10 10 30 is good time yes and one one uh, i don't know if anybody else has a question um i'll give give an opportunity for them to ask um but i have one other question related to briti um it's part of the chitta and behavior and i did lightning to know that which totally makes sense because that's why people repeat the same mistake sometimes <laughs> multiple times uh, if they don't become conscious but one thing i have realized that when a person raises their energy everybody they can do that through different means for some people it is already elevated then it seems that they do have a much better control on the vritti so could you enlighten a little bit on that i think it's also part of the personal experience uh, that when i somehow right. raise my energy hmm. then yeah, absolutely then what happens is your behavior in the middle of a lot of people or in uh, in critical environments it is very elevated yeah so if you could highlight on that thank you yeah this this is a very good point that vrittis are anyway there in our chitta and based on what subject we interact with those vrittis will be rising but what actions we will take despite being tempted by those vrittis are still in our control so if our intellect is awake conscious then we still have the opportunity to ignore those vrittis and do not get tempted into actions and this will happen only when we are consciously awake so as you said that somebody who is more conscious what the consciousness does it when we are conscious more conscious meaning we are more alert we are more vigilant despite we get certain thoughts which is nothing but derive derivatives of vrittis you know vrittis give the birth of thought so the thought in mind is driven by the vrittis from chitta so when we get certain thoughts caused by the vritti from chitta before that thoughts converts into action you have an opportunity to exercise your intellect that you got this thought but it is doable is it a righteous thought you will be able to give a pause and analyze that thought only when you are consciously awake so when you are more conscious let's say you are unconscious you know the unconscious meaning that your consciousness is not 100% with your action you are you are into something and certain vrittis are rising because you are not vigilant about what tendencies you are creating your senses will get into action this without analyzing the nature of the tendencies so the nature of vrittis whether it is righteous or unrighteous you know before it converts into action if you are conscious you will be able to make a judgment but if you are not that fully awake then automatically that vrittis will drive your mind and mind will drive your senses your action organs into performing actions and that's why many things we do in life without paying 100% attention to it how because it is driven by a series of vrittis let's say you're driving from home to work or work back to home despite you are thinking of something else you will see that your hand is automatically steering the car you know in right direction at the right moment why because you have gone through that many times so one vritti 
which is there within your your chitta is having a, a serial connections with other brithis so one brithi give rise to another brithi that give rise to another that give rise to another so the moment you come to a turn you know that that experience of a turn gives rise to the next brithi of taking left turn because that is already deposited in your chitta and that series of brithi is what is called habit you know, you are habituated that every time you encounter that signal, you know that from this signal, I take left turn. So automatically, your next vritti of taking left turn will rise within your chitta that will drive your organs of actions into performing that act. And automatically, you will take left turn. You don't need to pay full attention to it because you are not defining your actions. Your vrittis are defining your actions only for creating a new action new karma in your life we need to apply our 100 percent consciousness but for habituated actions you don't need to be 100 percent conscious about it because your actions are driven by your vrittis your series of vrittis which are already there in your chitta and that's why as you rightly said that when you are conscious then you cannot be the victim of vrittis because you can create the opportunity of new action only when you're fully awake, fully conscious. So vritti will ask you to do certain thing habitually, but because you're more conscious, you will decide yes or no. And you can choose to do a new action instead. Only when you're conscious, only when you're awake. So you rightly said that one who is more conscious is more likely to go against vrittis, control vrittis and do what is right. Yes. Hello, Vijayji. Uh, uh, you have described uh, vrittis very, very well in detail. Uh, in a second paragraph, could you explain the last sentence a practitioner of yoga reaches a state wherein they achieve ample sleep in a short period of time. And having reached a distinct zone of yoga, they attain the bliss of supreme being in an incessant 24-hour state of Akhanda Samadhi. Could you explain that part, having control the vrittis? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. So, yeah. So, this is a state of Jivan Mukta Samadhi. This is the state where one is already in union with Almighty. So, while you are in, uh, in this human body, you have raised your consciousness to have connection with the Supreme Being. And once you are having the flow of bliss from the Almighty to you, you meaning your soul, because your consciousness has established the bridge between Almighty and you for receiving the bliss from Almighty. Once you are in that state, the blissful state of union with Almighty, then 24 hours you are in that state of bliss and that's why it says they attain the bliss of supreme being 24 hours and while you are in that blissful state then the resting the body and you having no consciousness during the sleep, they become two distinct things, actually. Right now, when we are in disconnected state, when we are not having the enlightenment even about our own self, then when we go into deep sleep, we become fully unconscious. Whereas, 
one who is in 24 hours awakened state, who is in the awakened state of Jivan Mukta Samadhi, who is in who is 24 hours in the bliss of Almighty, he is never in sleep. He just rests the body. Because body and the organs of the body, the functionality, the machinery in the body, they need rest. Your cells need to recover from damages. So you give your body the rest. But your sensation, uh, not the sensation I would say, but your consciousness is never at sleep. Your consciousness is never at sleep. Your body is in sleep. But you are still consciously experiencing the bliss of Almighty. Whereas when we go into deep sleep right now, Right now, the moment you go to deep sleep, what happens? We lose our connection with the sensory subjects. And when we lose our connection with the sensory subjects, for us, the world becomes dark. We experience nothing when we are in the deep sleep. Not in the dreaming state though. I am saying the deep sleep. The deep sleep is a state when the soul disconnects from the mind and mind disconnects from the sensory organs. When the connection is broken, then there is no information, no experiences entering into the system because your senses have become inert. They do not capture any information for you to experience any further. Whereas those who are Jivan Mukta Yogi, those who are in 24 hours connection with Almighty, they are consciously always awake. So the body, resting the body, becomes very quick. Uh, uh, very quick, uh, what to say, the, the act for such yogi. It's a very quick act. It just rests the body. In few hours, the body will rejuvenate because it has no wavering of mind. Only when your mind wavers, then there is a turbulence in the body and it takes time for your cells to recover. Why do we sleep by the way? How do we feel fresh when we go to deep sleep? We feel fresh only because the damaged cells have recovered by your deep sleep. The more recovery, the better is the experience after you get up. And this recovery process is dependent on how restful you are, how restful your cells are. And those who are in the bliss of Almighty, nothing can be more restful than that. When you are in the bliss of Almighty, nothing can be more restful than that. And so such bliss embedded yogi can complete their sleep in no time and can rejuvenate their body in no time. So it is like that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, Vijayaji. So, um, so for awakened yogi, um, like you mentioned, they um, they are always conscious because they have their chetan karna, which uh, is operating. So they are probably in different avastha also, right? Either in uh, turiyatit or apt, one of those two avasthas, is it? Yeah, yeah. They are they are in apt avastha, apt, apt even apt, beyond apt. turiyatit. Yes, yes, yes. yes beyond turiyatit, but yeah. Mm. Apt okay. Avastha, so, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. One, you know, one other question I had was um, um, in the progression earlier that we had talked about when the uh, 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 the final stage of uh, relinquishing the the, the the physical world is when the manomai kosh dissolves and also the pranamai kosh and, and the prana gets dissolved first in the, at the ninth chakra. And man also gets dissolved at the ninth chakra. And uh, what happens to the chitta? Does that go along with those two? Sure. 
so first of all the prana gets dissolved in something called mahashunya or mahakash or the the zone of parmanu mandal prana mandal which is different from ninth chakra okay so it, it's little before you can say it, something like that so but yes uh, first prana gets dissolved and after that mind gets dissolved into ninth chakra the namam chakra namam kamal once these two are dissolved the chitta is silent chitta is within your body but what is traveling beyond body is your consciousness your mind your consciousness your breath it was the journey of three before and now the other two companion have become silent and the consciousness alone travels beyond that so chitta has no role anyways because chitta is not traveling in this progressive journey of meditation chitta just stays in the region called heart the only mobile thing in this body is uh, the mind and also the breath the prana so mind and prana goes along with your consciousness and and later in the higher state of meditation even the mind and prana are left behind and only consciousness travels further chitta is just idle it's inert it will it will play no role in in that higher zone because the chitta is functional only when the mind is functional chitta is otherwise inert teen karan man se jage man anu ek sthan all the three other inner organs like chitta buddhi intellect and ahankar these three inner organs are activated only by the association with the mind mind infuses the consciousness into it and mind brings the consciousness from the soul so mind is the carrier of soul's consciousness and it it passes on it passes that charge you know it passes the charge of consciousness into the chitta to make it functional but when the mind itself is now detached from the consciousness then mind itself has become uh, non functional and so the other organs your intellect your chitta everything has gone into complete silence because now you are acting on the periphery on the on the basis of your consciousness the consciousness alone is in action you have left all your jad karan you are now making use of your chetan karan the conscious mode conscious means uh, for the experience yeah that's it thank you so much so what happens to the repository like it goes back into the uh, parmanu it just kind of so the 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 repository in the chitta will continue to remain in the dormant state unless you have completed your complete journey you have completed your journey of union with almighty the moment you attain union with almighty then all your tendencies all your vrittis in chitta they burn away brahma vidya chinagi udi lagi karm ghar aag karm vasana jar gayi chetan chetan jag so once you acquire union with almighty the the brahma vidya the 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 light of supreme being then burns all your tendencies from chitta it becomes pure and then you don't act by, uh, by getting driven by the vrittis but you act you perform karma purely by your 
own consciousness. There's no vritti driven karma anymore. It is your consciousness driven karma. Your all actions are done with full consciousness. Thank you so much. And that yeah. absolutely clarifies it very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a little time, but I had one other question about the desire. Uh, we know that the soul has the three properties, desire, knowledge, action, but that is in the the intrinsic to the Atma. Right. But as it attaches, as it descends and attaches into the, uh, the mic world, mm -hmm. then a separate desire gets created. That right. so what how is that desire um that probably is related to the chitta, man, ahamkar, and those things. So right. then it completely dissociates from the original desire. So if you could just bridge that link, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is also a very good question. I'm I'm totally impressed, Niranjanji, that you have been, you know, asking the right questions in all the satsang. And you've definitely transformed your thoughts, your understanding of spirituality very much in line with what Vihangam Yoga wants one to understand. I'm very impressed with your progress. Yeah, so desires that the soul gets is driven by the experience. You know, there's a cyclic relation between the desire action and knowledge there's a cyclic relation what kind of desire will you have you'll have let's say i nobody has heard about patwatoli imagine you have not heard about patwatoli will you ever have desire of patwatoli you will never have because you have no experience of it you have no knowledge of it only when you have knowledge if you get some hint of something then only you will desire for it. So your desire is driven by knowledge. And how is your knowledge acquired? Knowledge is acquired by engagement, by your actions. Only when you consume, you experience something, that experience brings knowledge. So your actions is the reason behind knowledge. Your knowledge is the reason behind desire. And your desire is the reason behind actions. So they have a cyclic relation. Now, where is this cyclic, where is this cycle from uh, functional? In what zone it is functional? It, it depends on where you're stuck at. Wherever you are stuck at, whatever you are experiencing right now, your desires will revolve around that. Because you are experiencing that thing. You are experiencing a subject, you will have desires around it. You are engaging yourself into certain set of actions. That, that's what will, will kind of pull your cycle of desire, knowledge and actions into that arena. So it is totally up to where our cycle of desire, experience, you know, the knowledge and actions lies is what is defining the nature of your desire, where you are keeping your cycle. So if one is too much engrossed into worldly affairs, then their desires will also revolve around that. But when one starts trading higher, and starts going beyond the worldly affair in the meditational experiences, then because their experience level is now beyond worldly, so their desires also transform beyond worldly. So with this, we can understand that as we grow above the worldly subjects, automatically our desires also leaves the space of physicality and it attains its purest nature and what is the purest nature of desire the purest nature is where you truly belong what you have been experiencing in your true self and that's what 
the nature of your desire also become the moment you elevate yourself in the portal of consciousness. When you enter into the portal of consciousness, then all that remains is the conscious experience. So your desire also then transforms back to experience the Almighty. Because you have experienced Almighty before, that awakens within yourself. Atma Gyan Jab Uday Bhai Shudhi Bhai Apanadesh The moment you attain the enlightenment about yourself, that very moment, the memory of your you being in union with Almighty, you being in the abode of bliss, that also awakens within yourself. You remember that. You remember that. The moment you, rem you in get enlightened about yourself, the consciousness about you being in the bliss ecstasy of the Almighty's bliss that also awakens within yourself so atma jnana jab uday bhai shudhi bhai apana desh bhed dori sad guru diya gati sushman pravesh so Swamiji writes in Sarved that when you elevate yourself into the self enlightenment then that very moment your desire of attaining the union with Almighty will also strengthen automatically so, in a nutshell, whatever the level of experience we are at, our desires are also constrained within that zone, domain, within that realm. Yes, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much, Mijaji. Yeah. So thank you, Niranjanji, for your uh, you know very spiritually inclined questions, and thank you, Vijayji, for you know giving such a beautiful answers uh, to all the questions. Uh, it was really you know um, very uh, enlightening uh, to you know understand these topics. So thank you both uh, for your contribution. So uh, looking at the time, uh, we will move to the next uh, section of this satsang. So next section is basically warriors of the week. Uh, and we all know that the best time to meditate is Brahma Murat, uh, which is between 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. But uh, most of us are uh, not able to take advantage of this time. So to encourage all of us, Navy has started a WhatsApp group called Brahma Murat Warriors. Uh, the goal uh, of that group is basically to motivate each disciple uh, to take advantage of this time and make faster spiritual progress. Uh, in this group, basically, you do not join any session. You do meditation in the Brahma Murat um, yourself. And once you are done uh, with the meditation, you simply send a done message on the group. Um, if you are, uh, if you want to be part of that group, please uh, uh, let us know and we will add you to the group. Uh, so... <clears throat> We to, so this week's uh, warriors are uh, Bhagwati Patel ji, uh, Radha ji, Surya Alam Raju ji, Tejinder ji, and uh, Yogesh Shirsagar ji. Uh, these are the disciples who have been meditating uh, during uh, Brahma Murat every single day. Uh, along with them, we have inductees of the week. Uh, these disciples have meditated at least one or more day uh, or more days uh, throughout the week uh, during Brahma Murat. Uh, they are Amit Talekar ji, Lal Mani ji, Vijay Dauluri ji, Venita ji, Prachik Shirsagar ji, Rashmi ji, my name is also there and Sri Ram Sahu ji. So thank you everyone for encouraging us uh, to stay on the path of spirituality and take advantage of the most pious time for uh, meditation. So, um, you know, I would request everyone to take advantage of this time. Uh, this is the best time to meditate and make faster spiritual progress. So with this, uh, we have come to the last phases of our uh, workshop today. Uh, in this phase, we are going to chant short version of uh, Guru Vandana, Aarti and Shanti part. Vandana is a prayer uh, through which we seek blessings of the Sadguru. Uh, we request well-being, health, wealth and seek his blessings for spiritual knowledge. 
So I would request uh, Jessica Ji to sing last few lines of Guru Vandana. Over to you, Jessica Ji. Jessica Rudev, Vandana. Prabhu Kapa Santa Samaja Uttama Sarva Dharma Acharya He Jimmy Nadia Ashrita Sinduki He Vishwa Pata Maya Karya He Prabhu Satya Santa Samaja Tira Aparaksha Kiji Jana Sada Fula Gyana Bhakti Ridi Dina Dina Kiji Thank you Jessica Ji for such a wonderful prayer. Our next prayer is Arti. Uh, here we acknowledge the power of Almighty and pray that all disciples experience eternal joy, love and freedom from worries under his holy guidance. So I request everybody to stand up for the Arti and I again request uh, Jessica Ji to say the last few lines of Arti. Arti Jai Guru Deva Hare Sata Guru Deva Hare Shisha Janana Keshan Shana Medo Rakare Jo Shana Miawe Sata Pata Pawe Mohamite Jivaka Sukha Shanti Vea Pawe Dukha Damite Jagaka Guru Morati Gati Chandrama Seva Kanayana Chakor Palaka Palaka Nira Katarahe Guru Morati Kiyor Shweta Shweta Maya Shweta He Shweta Shweta Maya Shweta Tina Pada Amrita Bara Shweta Mahanada Shweta Ashta Chakra Sabashunya Bara Tara Ada Kepa Tahasa Dafula Karakia Puli Bara Sansa Thank you, Jessica Ji, for singing Arti with such a melodious and devotion-filled voice. Um, so I request all of you to sit down for our next prayer, uh, which is Shanti Part. <clears throat> so in the Shanti Part, we chant for peace for everyone in this universe. May Sadhguru Dev bless the entire cosmos with peace, love, and prosperity. I would again request uh, Jessica Ji to recite last few lines of Shanti Part. Shanti path. Hey, Prabhu Shanti Swarupa Ho, Shanti Shanti Maya Shanti, Shanti Shanti Jana Shanti Ho, Borla Shanti Maya Shanti. Hey, Prabhu Shanti Pradana Kara, Dorava Ho Sarva Shanti, Deva Sadafala Shanti Maya. Shanti Shanti Sukha Shanti Holy Sadhguru Deva Kije. Thank you, Jessica Ji, for wonderfully reciting uh, Guru Vandana Arti and Shanti part uh, and concluding session in such a devotion filled voice. So uh, this concludes our today's session uh, and I would like to thank everybody, um, you know, for their participation. Special thanks to Vijay Ji, um, Niranjan Ji, uh, Asmuk Ji, Jessica Ji, uh, you know, other Niranjan Ji and Geet Ji for their support um, in conducting these uh, sessions. Um, I would also request everyone to ponder upon the topic that we discussed today um, and, you know, try to make a spiritual progress. Uh, so we'll see you all next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the same Zoom session. And until then, have a wonderful day ahead. And Jai Sadhguru Dev to everyone.